you are doing science and research, but at the same time, you're you're putting it all in into practice, you know, so, um, and and getting some some pretty amazing results um, by the looks of it. I mean, one thing that really excited me was when you uh, um, you uh, the, you know the discoveries and the the progress you've made with uh, the bumphead parrotfish. Um, um in palau and with biota i mean that you know to be able to to sort of grow that that species to me at least on, on a personal level it's very exciting I, I grew up on reefs in malaysia where we used to see them in very large numbers and then now we you don't wow. really see them at all you know Man, honestly, that's um, that part of this whole project has been my my passion. It's been I've been really lucky to do it. I've had a really really good staff. I you know it's taken so much work to to get through that. It took us four years of uh, trials just with the larvae before we could get any through to settlement. You know, it was four years. Yeah, it took a long time, and I I don't know how we did it because it really was challenging. But luckily, we had the space and and I had access to the aggregation. So I guess I should explain how I do it. Basically, Palau is particularly unique because um, it's such a small area of, of complex reef with really, really good mix of fish species and, and you know, healthy reefs and fairly untouched as far as fishing. It, there is some pressure, but it's, it's really healthy compared to a lot of the other uh, reefs that I've dived in the last five years or so. And um, so we're, luckily here we get a, a, a unique spawning aggregation uh, actually of several species but the behavior is just incredibly predictable it's like we know every month these four days we can guarantee there'll be at least a thousand usually up to three four three thousand four thousand depending on on the, the time of the year but they will always be there these like young adult bump head parrotfish all the males headbutting each other and you know sparring for space and it's you can do it to the almost to the minute. You know, we can literally pull up there at six in the morning and say, okay, now everybody roll in, and they start going off. It's mind blowing, and and yeah. to see it happening on such a scale uh, is just an experience in itself. And I, I was actually here as a tourist uh, the first time I did it, and I was you know watching this happen and just seeing all these eggs, and then I started thinking like these fish are incredible because and we'll switch here to to talk about aquaculture. One of the biggest issues in aquaculture, right? The one of the sort of highest cost and most prohibitive issues is the source of protein. And of course, a lot of aquaculture projects end up, uh, you know, sending a trawler out to, to sort of kill a bunch of fish to then process and turn into high protein meal, which they then use to, to feed the fish. And that kind of defeats the purpose of sustainable seafood. If you're killing fish to grow fish, you know, you're better off just eating the fish you killed, actually, because it's a lot less, a lot more energy, uh, you know, less energy expenditure. Um, and so sure enough, I, I was doing the math and obviously I'm already, uh, at the time I was living in the Marshall Islands growing corals commercially, you know, we're pumping out maybe 3,000 frags a, a month or something like that. And, and it was, it was, you know, I already had that science down and it's not hard. It's, it's, uh, it's just about being consistent. And then I just started thinking, well, hang on, these guys eat coral. Uh, they're one of the highest value reef fish for commercially for feed, which is why they're so rare at the moment. Uh, they eat coral, they're peaceful, they'll grow together. And I just started thinking, hey, I'm gonna try and raise these guys. I can catch the eggs reliably and, and whatever. So I, I moved to pull out to set up an ornamental hatchery, but that idea was always in the back of my head. Like maybe I can make this a tangible food fish species. And, and I should clarify, not just food fish, but also potentially restocking and, uh, you know, other projects like that. Because I know there's a lot of places that don't have that species anymore and they, they want them back. So uh, we're actually working on a project right now with um, fish and wildlife. So I have uh, about 200 uh, baby bumphead right, right now. They're sort of just under two inches. Uh, they're eating a wide range of food. They're growing pretty fast. And the plan is uh, by the end of 2021 to actually send them to Guam and uh, get them settled and then try and reintroduce them in a protected area of Guam. And then hopefully we'll get a, a PhD student on that to, to monitor them and see if we can try and bring back a population there. Oh, that's, that's amazing. I mean, it blows my mind. I mean, uh, <laughs> they're, uh, you know, it's such an amazing species of fish and, yeah, just uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty speechless. 
<laughs> but I, and I do that's like great. Them. That's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really exciting. Yeah, I do like. Just that. such a great fish, and yeah, it, it's just so sad that they're so vulnerable. Like the, you know, they're so big and beautiful, and they they just sleep in the shallows in schools. They have so much personality, and and for me, that makes it hard enough to even think about them as a food fish, but. When we're looking at sustainability, long-term protein, all these these problems that are coming in our generation, uh, they make it makes a lot of sense. You know, they're, they're a peaceful grazer that you can literally farm the coral here in the islands ourselves and feed the fish and raise them to to market size or to restocking size, which I keep saying, but I because I, I do want it to be, you know, I believe that they're just as valuable alive as they are on the plate, in the yeah. sense that there's a lot of islands that have overfished them. Whereas if we can set up a process. Uh, that they're restocking, you know, putting a thousand fish down every month on a certain reef, then then you can probably open up a sustainable fishery. A sustainable fishery, you can actually you can probably say, all right, you can take fish, you know, between thirty and forty centimeters two per person or something like that to begin with and monitor it and actually balance that that recovery and keep Absolutely. restocking. So you've got an endless supply of these, and the genetics is strong. All that, it's, you know, it's not the because the broodstock are wild, there's no blending. Like they can be at hatcheries, there can be some issues depending on where your broodstock came and stuff. But yeah. Anyway, it's it's a yeah. There's a lot to it, but it is exciting, and I do believe it's a it's a, a species with a lot of potential for for you know future solutions. So yeah, we're still at it. Absolutely. On on all those on all those um, sort of all the aspects of uh, that I know on the on the Bioda website, you know you, your your aims of, about. Uh, sustainability, food security, it, it covers all bases almost in, the, in that one species. <laughs> <laughs>